In today's Grandmaster Game Analysis, I'll be showing you guys the game between Vladislav Artemiev, one of the up-and-coming strongest chess players in the world right now. I won't be surprised to see him in the top 10 very, very, very soon. And Wei Yi, one of the strongest, if not the strongest Chinese chess player out there right now. Who wins? I'll be showing you guys that and its game coming straight up. This game was played between Artemiev is white and Wei Yi is black on May 5th in the Chess.com Online Nations Cup. And in this game, at this time, they were only 16 points away with Wei Yi being the one with the upper hand. So this game was going to be close and it was going to be exciting no matter what happened here. So let's see what actually happened. So the game began with pawn c4 and this is just an English defense. It's not the most common opening, but it's super duper good at the highest level because in this type of opening, there's not really that many theoretical lines. And even in those theoretical lines, white usually gets a slight advantage that he can push for, just push for the win Magnus Carlsen style. So c4 and pawn g6, not the most common move. Usually knight f6 is played, but g6 is called the great snake variation. But in this, uh, in this position over here, whether or not it's a really great opening, it's debatable. Knight f6 is probably preferred because after knight f6, at least you get to control of the center. g6 just says you're going to Fianchetto extremely, extremely quickly. After g6, white counters. He says, I'm going to play pawn g3, develop my bishop on g2. And the reason why people do this is because you put a bishop on a very, very nice diagonal. Bishop b7, bishop g2, knight f6, knight c3, all very normal developing moves, nothing too special c5, castle, d5. And so in this position, black already strikes towards the center. However, you should always be careful when you do something like this because white has a very nice bishop here. So if we do something like this, 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 which doesn't happen in the game, you always have to be careful of some discovered attacks at the very end. In this position, there are none, but you always have to be careful. So after this, queen b3 was played, basically saying, I want to capture your knight, you better do something about it. And black plays pawn e6, which is not actually a move he wants to do, but because he wants his knight to stay on um, d5, um, that's why he plays pawn e6. Now, the reason why you don't want to move the pawn to e6 is very simple. It blocks in this light square bishop, which we will see become a partial problem as uh, the game continues. Because after e6, where is this bishop going to go? I suppose you can take a couple moves to play bishop e7, and life will be okay. So in this position, pawn d3, and if you really think about it, this kind of looks like a dragon-like setup as white, as you can have like your pawns like this, your amazing bishop on g2, you have a minority attack over here. The only difference is that um, the pawn is not on e5. If this pawn was on e5 instead of e6, this would be kind of like a Maroxy bind. And in those positions, usually the one who's actually performing the Maroxy bind is slightly better. But in this position over here, White is slightly better due to the fact that he has more development and also this pawn on e6 is not very good on pawn on e6. So in this position, knight c6 was played and queen b5, basically saying, hey, your bishop's not on fa anymore defending this pawn, so you better do something about this pawn. You can't play pawn b6 in this position, which is a move you really so dearly want to play because it allows your bishop to develop, but you're not able to because this knight is hanging. So in this position, queen goes to b6, basically saying, hey, don't um, don't attack my knight, don't attack my pawn, and you never want to take here. I see a lot of beginners slash intermediate players take queens when they're like this, but it's generally not good because if the pawn captures back, guess what? The rook has an open file, and this position is actually very good for the black side. So in this position, the queen just says, all right, my job's here finished. I provoked your queen to go to b6, so you can no longer play pawn b6, which allows your bishop to be happy. So the black queen just follows and says, hey, I really want to play pawn b6. I'm going to move my queen here. And so in this position, knight e4 was played. And after knight e4, capture, capture. And this knight is forced to move. It goes to b6, attacking this pawn. It's actually quite difficult to defend. If you play pawn b3, that's a problem because bishop takes your rook. So how do you defend? Do you move a knight here? But if you move a knight there, guess what? If you move this knight, then this square becomes weak. But if you move this knight, and then guess what? Your bishop on c1 is bad forever. And you don't necessarily want this. So in this position, a move that would be very typical here is maybe just knight takes c5. Because you win a pawn, your opponent wins a pawn, and you get into a relatively equal uh, endgame in which nobody, not one side is better. But in this position, um, 
our team Yev decided to set up a trap and see where you would fall for it. So instead he played rook b1 with a very simple idea, I'm just going to play pawn b3 in my next move if you don't capture my pawn, which way Yi is like, okay, it's a free pawn, so I'll take it. And this position, still knight takes c5 is very good, for our team Yev decides to set up a trap, b3. So my question for you guys, imagine you were playing in Wei Yi's position, all right? Where would you move this knight? Would you move it back to b6, a5, e5, or d6? Only one of these moves is actually gives black a slight advantage. In every other position, white will have a pretty slight advantage, and you will have a pretty difficult endgame. In fact, one of them is just completely bad, so hopefully you don't choose that one. So pause your video, try to determine what is the best move in this position for the black knight. So hopefully you guys paused your videos, and if you guys did, hopefully you guys found knight just back to b6, allowing the capture over here. Now, you might be thinking, oh, in this position, it looks relatively equal, but as playing as black, that's pretty fine for you, right? Because black is, always has a slight disadvantage going into the game, as he is the one going second. So in this position, however, black decided not to go here, and knight d6 is just terrible because you could just capture it. Black decided to play actively and decide moving the knight to e5. But this is a problem. This causes a big problem for black. And the reason isn't so clear, but once you see that this bishop on c it's not very good, you realize that black is trying to trade off an active piece for an active piece of white, but this is something you don't want to do when you have a very bad piece, which black does on c8. Because the more active pieces you trade off, the more obvious and more blaring your weakness of having a bad piece will become. How? Let me show you guys, or let our team here show you guys how it's done. Knight captures here, bishop captures in bishop h6. White develops his final piece with tempo, and his bishop on c8 is still extremely terrible. Rook c8 is played, and rook fd1, basically challenging this rook on the d-file, saying, hey, I'm going to be attacking your rook, are you going to capture me? If you capture me, I have this open file all to myself. And guess what? Your position is still very bad, because guess what? This pawn, even though you're up an extra pawn, White can capture it at any, any time whatsoever, and not only that, his bishop, compared this bishop with this bishop on c8, this bishop on g2 is a monster, it will be taking control of this entire game. How? We'll see. So after rook b8 is played, black is basically saying, alright, I'm going to play pawn b6, I don't want any like, silly shenanigans on this open diagonal, and I'm going to finally play bishop to b7. But white just says, alright, I'm going to take your pawn, and if you try to play b6, guess what? I'm going to take your knight for free. In fact, in this position, there's actually a threat if black is not careful. Black white could capture here and then take this rook on d8 if he doesn't know any better. Now, of course, bishop c7 was played basically saying, I'm going to defend my rook so none of these silly shenanigans can happen. But as you can see already, white is putting a lot of pressure on the light squares. And this is something you guys want to do if you ever see your opponent's bishop stuck on c8, if you can get a knight to c5 and you have a bishop on g2. Look how much pressure is actually uh, being put here. Look how strong everything is right now. Do you guys see this? The bishop is stuck. The bishop can't come here because we just take for free. You don't want to take here because that doesn't improve your position. It just helps white. And you can't play b6 because you win the knight. So every piece is stuck in this position. Except for maybe this bishop in e5. But what can this bishop really do? We can't defend dark at light squares. It's a dark square bishop. So black is in a dilemma. He has some issues. So bishop c7 is basically just trying to consolidate, maybe he's trying to go to b6, chase the knight away this way. And after this, bishop g5 basically poking this rook and saying, hey, you better capture me here so I can get my open rook over here. And f6 is just a free pawn. So capture, capture. And in this position, all four of black's pieces are on the queen side, but they're all stuck. Why? Because the bishop can't move, because it will get captured for free. The pawn can't move, because then this knight will be captured for free. And so the only piece that really can move is basically this bishop. So king g7 is played, knight back to e5, and after knight e5, bishop e5, and after this, just knight to d6, basically saying, hey, I want to capture here maybe in the future. Not right now, of course, because this bishop is just really bad, but it has an idea. If your bishop goes to d7, but then perhaps we can play a move like knight c4, and your position is completely bad. Let's just see what would happen. Let's say bishop d4 would, would be to occur, then we have bishop takes c6, and after bishop takes c6, bishop takes c6, and then rook takes d4, white is up a piece, or something like this. And here, there's a lot of trouble, right? Like, what else can you play? If you play, if you decide to play bishop g7, then your bishop on d7 is hanging, and everything is hanging in this position. So. Really, there's really no alternative. The best move here is probably just to capture, but once you capture back, you're in, in, in a bigger bind 
what do you do in this position? Look, bishop can't move, pawn can't move, and if the knight moves, let's say knight decides to go over here, then guess what's going to happen? We can play this move bishop f4, and still the bishop can't move. Sure, your knight can take a free pawn, but this is just terrible because rook d2, discover attack, and attacking the knight, you lose a piece. So black is in a complete bind. There's nothing he can do to get out of this. So instead, what happened was that after this, uh, knight d6, h6 was played, bishop e3, which puts black in an even funnier bind because this now the knight can't move because otherwise we just win the pawn for free. So in this position, the knight goes to b4, and then this position, after the very next move, Wei Yi actually resigned in this position. So pause your videos, everybody. I want you guys to start thinking for yourself. If you were playing the great Wei Yi, how would you guys try to finish him off in this position? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I'll give you guys a couple seconds. And if you guys uh, thought for a second, this move isn't actually too difficult. If you guys still haven't solved it, here's a clue. I'll tell you the clue. It's a decoy. We're going to decoy a piece to go somewhere it does not want to go to. And when it does, we strike. So the best move in this position is bishop takes a6 check. You might be wondering, isn't that a free bishop? And indeed it is. You have to capture it. Otherwise, it's just a free pawn. But after you capture this, knight takes f7. And guess what? It's a double fort, which means after the king takes, we can take the bishop for free. White is up two pawns in this position. Even though you can try to win this one, then perhaps we can even play rook here, just win the a7 pawn. Maybe we could just play a normal move like king f1. And white is, black is still in the complete bind that he was in a couple moves ago. So I hope you guys enjoyed this game. I found it very fun, and I really see a lot of potential in our team meetup. He's one of the players I'm rooting for to become one of the next challenges of Magnus Carlsen. And if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And make sure to watch that video over there where I analyze the game between the world champion himself and Fabiana Caruana.